The opinions of the commentator or commentators are solely those of the commentators and not of CJAD 800 or Bell Media. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Good evening. Welcome to today's Entrepreneur, presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller. Good evening, Josh. Hello. And this evening, we'll be profiling Beverly and Michael Solitino of West Group. Uh, they are uh, in the eye care business, and we'll get to them momentarily. Uh, but first, as usual, we'll begin with uh, some entrepreneur-related news of the week. And, uh, you know, when a lot of job numbers are coming out, and most of them in Canada or in the States are generally quite positive, but my my issue when it comes to these numbers is that we, we're really talking about not really good jobs. We're talking about low-paying jobs, a lot of service jobs. We're seeing most of the growth in the economy in that sort of sector. So the story from BNN today was kind of interesting. A uh, trend in U.S. Uh, retailing um, retailers now sort of competing over what's 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 known as the the low end talent or the entry level jobs. Why are these jobs becoming so desirable? You think? Well, a, a it's first of all, I think it's just kind of scary that that business people are looking for low end talent and i guess we we can't think of it or talk about it as low talented people it's just low end talent because you can certainly understand the misnomer the misunderstanding behind it i guess the low end talent is you know we we've spoken many many times dan with entrepreneurs and there's always a talk about cultures of the right characters the right personality cuz you can it's tough to train character. It's tough, tough to get a, a good fit, but it's easy to it's easy, much easier to train a job. It's easier to train what people do. So if you get the low end, the lower end, call it uh, on the 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 rung lower end rung of the of the employee scale, well then, but, but they have a fantastic attitude. Well then, much easier to train and maybe bring up. Uh, are there people also out there that? have lost jobs, no question about it. Are they looking for, for places to start regardless of what it is because they have to start over again? Absolutely. Now, are retailers or entrepreneurs, are they looking specifically for low end? I would say not necessarily. I think they're looking more for the right fit. And at the end of the day, they got to they gotta really figure out what they need because it's not just a you know random, let's hire 10 people and we'll keep six if they work out and, and go from there. You, you want to be, I guess, as targeted as possible. Nobody wants to waste dollars. That's for sure. Also in uh, retailing news, the drop shipping model becoming more popular. Uh, this, I guess, is uh, when retailers sort of scale down and uh, and make themselves more of, a, I guess, a forwarder of goods between the wholesaler and the, and the customer. Well, I, I think this has been in existence for, for decades. The question becomes, how do you do it and how do you make sure that your end customer doesn't know who you're buying from, and then they skip out the middleman, which is you. Uh, I think that's that's the real trick. However, if you can work it properly and you can make sure that the information of the goods get from your subcontractor to your customer and they don't know who they're buying from and they still deal through you and you're the one giving customer service and they really want to, you know, transact with you and not skip you because, you know, everybody has to share a profit. Well, then I, I think that's that's where the entrepreneurs have to be smart about it. It's 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 can be very tricky, especially when, you know, you're dealing with with suppliers overseas and for them you know, they care about a sale and you may or may not be important to them, the, the local entrepreneur, the mo local distributor. Uh, and, but if you're not so important to them and they want the fast buck, they might bypass you too. So it's, it's, it's all about doing it smartly, but if you do it smart and you don't, you know, I guess you have the right divulging of information, then there's no question. You can certainly save on costs and add more to your bottom line. And a popular way to start businesses these days uh, is crowdfunding, something that I have sort of mixed feelings about. Sometimes it works, sometimes it works less well. Um, equity crowdfunding coming to Canada with, uh, with one industry leader, and uh, they're going to sort of give you a little bit more than, say, an advanced look at whatever this product is going to be or a T-shirt or some gimmick. They're actually going to give you uh, equity in, in the company that you're uh, putting money into. It's it's certainly very new, and uh, and I'll admit myself, I, I don't know too much about it, but Saskatchewan has has started or allowed legislation to allow this, allow this crowdfunding of not just 
uh, giving away product as you're as you're saying, but actually you can buy shares through these crowdfunding sites. Now that that I'm sure is going to pose a number of issues. Forget the legislation side; just on the business side, it's enough. You know, uh, I'm sure as we'll hear, it's an it's and as we heard many times, it's enough having you know a few different partners. Let alone I don't know how many partners you end up having uh, in uh, if you start going crowdfunding and everybody puts in a few dollars. Uh, you know, minority shareholders, it's great to take their money, but sometimes if they have rights, I mean, that's, that's the end of the day, a shareholder has rights. And if you don't appease all your shareholders, uh, then there's, there's certain things that they can come back to you on. And that's something that's just a little scary. So great from a, you know, easier to get funding, easier to get some investors, but entrepreneurs or business people better go in eyes wide open because the moment you have uh, these minority shareholders as small as it is and they feel they're persecuted they're not getting the right information etc cetera, etc cetera, the lawyers will get rich and uh, let's head over to real estate now and uh, josh is this the beginning of uh, the bubble bursting housing starts have fell to its lowest level in five years and uh, this from the globe and mail uh, when it comes to they're, they're pointing the finger at condo and multi-residential product pr- uh, pr- uh, projects um, which have uh, a lot of unsold inventory these days, especially in certain cities that will go unmentioned. <laughs> the uh, you, you know it's it's really tough to say, and I, I won't say my crystal ball is less foggy than everybody else's. Uh, you know, there, there's no doubt there's a lot of inventory out there. You look at downtown Montreal, you see all the buildings going up. You can certainly hear reports about people migrating to the city. It's amazing because you hear some reports that say there's there's you know thousands of thousands of people you know leaving the the suburban areas coming towards downtown, and then you have other completely contradictory reports saying you know what people are tired of driving in they don't want to deal with the traffic they don't want to deal with the potholes and and all the grief that that with the construction going on i honestly don't know who to believe sometimes because you know you can make your numbers say you know listen from an accounting standpoint you can almost make your numbers say whatever you want them to say uh but the, the i i still believe that it is more of a buyer's market than a seller's market it's more of a renter's market than a than a than a lesser's market uh, there's no doubt you still have to do your homework that the prize areas will always remain the prize areas. Uh, but, but if you, if you have a little bit of, of waiting time and, and you have a little bit of gumption and a little negotiation ability, you, you're better off being the buyer and the renter in the in these situations. Loblaw is announcing that they're opening 50 new stores and doing some major renovations as well. So maybe they're trying to uh, uh, target uh, well target now that they're gone, I guess, and and maybe uh, even chip away at Walmart as well. What do you think of Loblaw's uh, ambitious expansion? Uh, I think they're taking advantage of an opportunity. I think they understand the Canadian market very well. I mean, that's been proven over many, 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 many years uh, where Target didn't. So Target wasn't necessarily all bad in their thought process. They've got some pretty good locations, uh, maybe not all the best, but but Loblaws is taking advantage of, of this market because they did have sales. They might not have had enough sales to make it go, but they had a lot of sales and customers want like the new stuff and like different. So if somebody's going to go out and redevelop, re, not necessarily rebrand, but refresh their market, the consumers are ready and willing to go and find that new place and that new area to go. And I think that the lesson for entrepreneurs to take and I know Loblaws is on a much bigger scale, but the entrepreneurs is don't don't be afraid to refresh. As a matter of fact, you better refresh every now and then. You better sometimes reinvent yourself every now and then because if you get stale, you are dead. Finally, and uh, speaking of uh, companies that are doing a bit of a refresh, Apple again peddling the iWatch. I don't know. We'll talk about this on the exchange later tonight, but I'm not so sure consumers are ready to put a, a watch up to their face and talk into it. <laughs> uh, listen, it's it's certainly been the, the talk of the day, the talk of the week, uh, you know, whether it's Apple, whether it's Pebble, whether whether it's Samsung, wh- whatever technology company is going to come out there. Uh, you know, I, I guess you got to give them... You got to give them credit for trying to be, I won't say a, a first to the market because there's other people out there, uh, but certainly they are a major player and they're going to do it. For me, I don't wear a watch. I use my phone. I don't need a watch to tell me to look at my phone. Uh, you know, I don't need somebody else telling me what to do, you know, watch or, or people, but we won't go there. <laughs> seems like a, a product category that maybe requires a little little marinating time uh, for the consumer. But you'll always have your first adopters. You'll always have your gadget people and they will, and Apple will always sell products. The question is how much, when, for how long, and when is the next upgrade going to be? 
Today's entrepreneur on CJAD 800 coming up next, our profile for tonight, Beverly and Michael Solitinu of West Group. They are on the way, but first at 7.15. <laughs> professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar and Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you and our guests this evening, Beverly and Michael Solitinu of West Group. Beverly, Michael, welcome to CJD. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Uh, thanks for coming in. So um, the first question of the night is the easiest, of course. Uh, what do you do for a living? Tell me about West Group. Well, West Group, we're in the uh, eyeglass wholesale business. We design, create, manufacture, and sell to uh, all the independent eyewear providers. And you, now, the company's been around how long? 55 years. 55 years. Now, you're not... You haven't been there that long, you know. There's no video, but you haven't been there that long. No, so. our uh, our father started the business in 1961. He uh, he started. He had a partner. Uh, after a year, he bought the partner out, and he started uh, bringing in frames from the U.S. And then in uh, 1967, he went over to France and he started importing frames uh, from France. And he started uh, going door to door. He would uh, go out selling during the day. And uh, at night, he'd go back to the office, and he was one or two people, and he'd pack up the orders and ship them out. And every day, he'd, he'd do that. And then eventually, he built a staff, and uh, Bev and I came into the business. I came into the business in 1990, and uh, Bev came in in 94. Now, you don't sell to, to the public, right? You don't, you don't retailers, you're wholesale, you sell to the retailers. That's correct. We sell primarily to independent opticians and optometrists across Canada and U.S. and Europe, Australia. We're in about 40 countries now. Now, coming, okay, so your, your dad had his business for, call it, almost 30 years or before you, before mm -hmm. you guys kind of got into the picture. What was that transition like? I mean, what was that... You know, was it was it easy for him to take the the foot off the gas pedal? Uh, did you welcome in? Where did you start in the business? Uh, I don't know if Mike, you, I think you came in first and then Bev after, if I understand correctly. So, what was that kind of first stage? I, I think the first the transition that we had. My dad was very clear. He wanted me to learn the business from the bottom. So, you know, we had a full service laboratory. So I was working in the lab. I was grinding lenses. Then I went on the road selling and I was selling. Uh, I had a territory in northern Ontario, which in my, it's, my first customer was a nine hour drive. Uh, and I started uh, with the bags and I, I kept the bags up until I think last year. I finally gave up my territory. Mm. And uh, it, it's just so important to learn the business from the bottom up. You know, to start in the middle or to start at the top, you just can't learn it and you can't succeed if you don't know the business inside and out. And Beverly, when did you enter the picture and what was your kind of first roles? Um, I started in the business in, in 94. I graduated uh, with an MBA from Queens in marketing and international business. And I started the same way when I joined the company. I worked uh, in a couple of marketing positions at outside companies before I joined West Group. Uh, because I wanted to bring something from the outside in. My dad had been, um, you know, he had his business for 30 years and had done things the same way for 30 years. And, and for me, it was important to bring something new um, and sort of augment what he's been doing. But I also started in sales. Mm -hmm. um, I was living in Toronto. I had a full territory. I worked in sales full time for 10 years and slowly got more involved in the product development side of our business. Um, I'm now responsible for all the product design concept and uh, marketing of our company. But same as Mike said, unless you really understand the industry and your customer, you can't manage from an ivory tower. You, did you did your dad have a different kind of management style than than the two of you? Did that change drastically once you guys kind of came into the the management side of things? Well, as as any entrepreneur that started the business from zero, you know, he was rolling up his sleeves and he was doing everything. You know, even when we had when he had a staff of ten or twelve people, if he went into the back into the shipping area and he saw the the boxes lined up and it was backlogged, he would roll up his sleeves and he would help pack. End of story, right? Where I look at it a different way. If I go in the back and I see there's a backlog of of 
product and I have no problem rolling up my sleeves and, and packing, but my first question would be, why is there a backlog? How do we fix it that you don't need my help because I'm not always there to help. So I think there's a, there's certainly a, a different style in management. You know, when, when we, we had probably 10 years ago, we had a seven year succession plan. And, uh, this plan was a slow transition from my dad running the company to Bev and I running the company. And we took our time and we had very strategic plans. And, you know, at the time we had low management. It was my dad, myself, Bev, and that was it. And when we decided that we were going to move the business into our hands, the first thing that we said was we need more managers. We need to supervise this company a little bit different, differently, and we need to create a place where we could allow people to grow and we could have a wonderful culture to have people come alive and build the business up. Today's entrepreneur on CJAD 800. Our guests are Beverly and Michael Solatino of West Group. More with them in just a moment at 724. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Our guests this evening, Beverly and Michael Solatinu of West Group, and we're talking about a bit of the uh, the uh, the history of West Group, the succession plan, the transition plan, and, uh, and now uh, Beverly and Michael are running the show, Josh. And it was very interesting. Just before the break, Mike said something pretty quickly. He said there was a seven-year succession plan. And I got to tell you, of all the, the the many guests that we've had on the show, Dan, uh, you don't always hear of a, a formalized succession plan, as Mike was alluding to. So, I kind of want to elaborate and hear a little bit more about that. The seven, this seven-year plan was this initiated by your dad? Was it the three of you? Uh, how did, how did this kind of come about? And I know I'm pretty sure you're past it by now. So. How smoothly did it go and how many changes or bumps were there along the way? I, I think the most important thing was that, you know, even when we started, I started 90 and Bev in 94, it was always about being open and being honest. And in 2003, 2004, we, we started talking about moving the business over to us. And it was, it was really a group effort. Uh, you know, my dad wanted to slow down. He wanted to spend more time in Florida during the winter time. And we kept saying, no problem. But if you want to slow down and you want to leave for a month or two months or three months, your responsibilities have to be moved. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if that's just the normal way. Now, he didn't want to quickly move out but a seven-year plan was a, a we felt very comfortable it was a very slow process you know i would take over the sales and and bev would slowly take over all the inventory and all the buying and and all the different commitments and uh and uh it just it just happened very smoothly and of course we started adding managers and just getting used to the managers, whenever you create a position, it comes off the bottom line right off the hop. Mm -hmm. So as soon as those managers start paying back or start paying for themselves, we could move to the next step. Now, was was your dad, uh, forgive the term, was he a control freak? Was he was it no. easy to no. let it go of the reins? Yes. Yeah, I, I think the reason why this the, the plan worked is that it was something that we all wanted. It, he never felt that he was being pushed out we never felt that we had to do things a certain way, his way, and we just couldn't wait for him to leave so we can do things our way. It was never like that. And, and in that respect, we're very lucky. And that's why I think it the transition was so smooth. And when you guys were in the business and you're bringing ideas, whether it's new managers so that people do it, or perhaps new marketing or administration, uh, you know, the ideas were welcome. The ideas, I mean, you were, you were fairly transparent. It mm -hmm. sounds like it that, that worked pretty well. Uh, was there ever a point where, you know, there was any butting aheads or that was, it was pretty smooth? No, I, I could honestly say, you know, when we first started hiring managers, I remember our operations manager, Carol Cote, we hired her, <coughs> uh, we created this position and originally he didn't want to create this position. He says, we don't need this. We could do it ourselves. I knew if we would start to grow, we needed systems in place and we need someone firm to hold the systems in place. And we went on a buying trip and, and, you know, I was pushing my dad for uh, probably a good 10 to 15 months that we need an operations manager. And he kept saying, no, no, it's not the time. It's not the time. And then there was one time we, all three of us went on a buying trip. We come back two and a half weeks later and there's lineups out the door, all with systems issues of all the people that are working there. And that's when he said, that's it. 
go get your operations manager. So does that mean it was very informal before and you created a lot more processes and systems yes. when yes. you came in? Yes. Did you find that that was absolutely essential to go to the next level of your business? Absolutely. Yes. What specifically did you add that was probably the biggest change or resulted in the biggest change to your business? Uh, again, from a it's, process it's standpoint, the, the, I, having an operations manager, manager yeah, that layer you're saying, yes. that layer, and then having a sales manager, a national sales manager, and then having regional managers. But I think it's one thing to have managers, but it's another thing to empower people to feel part of of the business and really feel the success of their of the business is based on what they do and what they bring to the business and as we've heard so many times the the team and the human resource the the team around you really makes a huge difference mm -hmm. so when we come back from the break we'll talk a little bit more about your team and kind of how you find them and how you work together and uh, and we'll go from there beverly and michael solatino of west group this evening on today's entrepreneur at 7 30. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 7.34 on today's Entrepreneur. Welcome back. This is a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller and our guest this evening, Beverly and Michael Solatinu of West Group. And uh, let's move on to HR, Josh. And uh, well, guys, why don't we just start by by uh, talking about some of your employees? How, how many are there? How big is West Group? First? We have uh, 110 uh, full-time employees. And then we have in the U.S., we probably have another 20 uh, independent agents. Sales now, agents. Now, it, you've grown over the years. You, know, yes. you weren't always 110. No. Uh, I'm sure that's how. How do you, are you happy with your current culture and how do you maintain it? <laughs> the culture, first of all, we're absolutely thrilled with our culture. And that is a very key feature in everything we do at West Group. Uh, it's about who you are, accountability. Um, it's about being part of something and being proud of something. And we absolutely uh, work every day for keeping those values of our company culture. It is a very key piece of ingredients in helping us grow. I think also, even though we've grown and we've add, added layers, we've only added one layer, which I think is really key. We don't have a bunch of different managerial positions. We have us, then our one level of key management, and then all the other employees. So there's not a big path to get from the customer service rep to mm -hmm. Mike and I. And we're all accessible and there's we no one closes their door and it's very easy for us for any of them to come speak to any of us. Is it too easy maybe? Do you uh, do you find yourself No. no? Never. It's I, I again I think people people want a, a sense of accomplishment. They want to feel part of something and they want to feel that they count. And I it, it's so important for people to to feel like they belong and uh and the, the, the feeling that we get walking around the office, people are smiling, people are enjoying their job. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just, we feel, I'm, we're very proud of what, what we've done in terms of people. Do you do anything different or unique? Like, how do you, how do you ensure that this culture stays? Like, do you have, uh, whether it's family days or you have more social gatherings, uh, or I mean, is there anything you do that to maintain this like is uh, there a secret uh, no I, I we do family days we do sugar shack days and we do uh you know we we do all of that but again it, it it's the type of person we look when we hire them when we hire people you know uh most of the managers uh that we've hired it's on gut mm -hmm. on 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 a relationship on looking someone in the eye shaking their hands and i could see right into who they are so you would you say you hire more on character and fit than you do on skill set? Yes. Take your time, you know, really think about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll, I could tell you a quick story. When yeah. we hired our national sales manager, who is now our VP of sales, uh, we I, I, I looked at him in 1994, okay, or 95 at a local Ontario show uh, of optometrists, and he was a salesperson for somebody else. And I looked at him and I said, when are you going to come to a real company? Okay. And he looked at me, shook this. I love what you and your sister are doing. When you call me, I will come. And he was working for 
one of the largest international optical companies. So mm-hmm. for him, for for us, it was based on I, I think the fact that we're so accessible when you were asking like what yeah. do we how do you keep that culture? And I think the fact that Mike myself and my dad are all very accessible that I think that maintains the culture. I think as soon as you lose that and you be, you have a corporate attitude, your company becomes corporate. 11 years later, I called him Mm -hmm. and I said, I'm calling. And he remembered the conversation. And then in 2005, I said, I'm calling. And he says, okay, what position, what territory? Mm -hmm. And I said, Canada. He goes, okay, what, what section do you want me to sell in? I go, Canada, I need a national sales manager. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me, he says, but I'm a salesperson. I said, no, you're going to be my national sales manager. And he says, I've never done it before. I said, you could do it. And there you go. So now you you're you're an in international sales. I mean, you this company that started in sixty one. You're making uh, um, frames for for retailers. Uh, you're the generic brands. Like, at what point do you create your own? I think for us, um, we always we had built our business creating our own house brands, which were more generic brands, and also distributing for other companies. Uh, so being the Canadian distributor. And it came to a point where we realized that distributing other people's lo- uh, collections, we didn't have control over our business. And we were at the whim of whatever decision someone else made. So uh, we knew the Canadian market better than any American or European company that was selling in Canada. So we decided to, and we were always always successful with our own sort of house mm-hmm. brands. And we decided to take it to the next level and create eyewear brands that would rival any international brand. And we put a lot of money behind it to market those brands to create eyewear brands. Now, there's a lot of people that talk about, I'm going to create a brand. Now, that's a, you know, I'm going to create a brand. That small sentence really means a whole lot mm-hmm. more than that. What is the first big step that you have to take right after you say I want to create a brand you have to have a vision of what that brand is all about who the target who your target market is what you want the product to look like and what you want it to stand for and be clear that there is a market for what you are developing so did you do it right when you created your brand brand we did the first time absolutely and I think you also have to have staying power because it takes time everything takes time and you have to be willing to Understand you need to spend the money Mm -hmm. and you need to continue to spend the money and you need to continue to spend the money to create that brand. And you need to just keep pushing forward. And I think also because I was on the the road, I was the sales rep for so long, I was in the stores. So I saw where the hole was and we created a brand to fill that hole. If I wasn't in sales and we had been sitting around in the office, okay, let's create an eyewear brand. I don't know if we would have been as successful as we were. Do you get a lot of input from your customers? Do you solicit their input or is this all from your own knowledge and experience in the in the industry? I think it's both. Um, for me, even when I moved back to Montreal and went full time into product development, I still kept six accounts that I go down in Toronto and I still service. And I think it's very important um, in order to see what the competition is doing, but also hear the feedback on our product offering and what's working and what's not and how do we become better because they're the people that are selling our product. They're the ones that are getting the consumer reaction. If I'm not going to listen to them, then our our product is not going to be as successful as I want it to be. A slightly different question, although focusing around the same thing, trade shows. We've often heard, you know, on the show, on the program, uh, different entrepreneurs, their different take on trade shows. What do trade shows mean for you? Do, do they work for you? Do you feel they're beneficial? What's the pluses and minuses of a trade show for you? Uh, perception. You have to build a perception. If you're growing your business, you need to be in the industry and you need to show people who you are and you need to demonstrate that you're real. So trade shows, we attend uh, six international trade shows. We exhibit in all of them and we exhibit very large booths for perception. Yes, I like to write business at these shows Mm -hmm. and we do write some business, but the perception is probably more important than the business that I write at these shows. Trade shows today, are they different than the trade shows you did 10 years ago or 15 years ago? 
I think so. I'm. I think over the years, trade shows used to be a selling uh, show. Mm-hmm. And people used to write a lot of business. Now I think it's more networking. It's going around and seeing all the products that you may not deal with. But it gives you a chance to see what else is out there, perhaps for future decision making. And, and, and you're doing trade shows. You, you mentioned earlier on the program that you, you do sell internationally. It's not just Canada. It's not, not, not just North America. But really in various parts of the world. So I would imagine trade shows are also in various parts of the world. What would be your the biggest lesson or takeaway that you've had over the last 10, 15 years in, in selling internationally? What's worked best for you or what hasn't? I think the most important thing when you go international, we, we, we started very slowly in 2004. We went to our first show in Paris, then we went to Milan. Uh, and We've only learned recently that if you're going to go into these markets, you need to hire the people that are familiar with these markets. You know, we just came back from Milan and we just hired a new export manager to take care of all our business outside of North America. He's based in Italy and we had a, we had one of our best shows ever in Europe last week in Milan. We just, because you had a local touch. That's right. Excellent. I, you know, I think the international business, and there's so much more that we could talk about. But uh, we'll, well, we're coming up to our next break, but we're still going to stay on the international, at least selling to the U.S., Dan. Yes, Ernie Furt's going to join us, tax partner at Fuller Landau, and he'll uh, navigate some tax questions if you are selling to the, to, uh, the U.S. Uh, that's coming up on today's Entrepreneur 745. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar and Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you on today's Entrepreneur and our guests this evening, Beverly and Michael Solatino of West Group, and we'll bring in Ernie Furt as well, tax partner at Fuller Landau, uh, to talk about some of the tax challenges selling to the U- U.S., and uh, and there are many, it seems. And th- th- there's no doubt that we won't be able to cover everything in the next, uh, call it 10 minutes. Uh, but let's start with some of the highlights, Ernie. Uh, you have a Canadian company. They have customers in the U.S., uh, let's say they even have a subsidiary or a company in the U.S. What are some of the first things that they need to think about and make sure that they're doing properly? They just have to make sure that they have good representation in the states, sell their product, and understand that there may be some filing requirements in some of the states and some of the jurisdictions. Because you you can sell from Canada directly to the states, or alternatively, you can you can have your sub down there, and it can do that. But you have to ensure that. When you're in a certain state, you check out the rules with respect to that state with your accountant or with your accountant's affiliate, whatever it may be, so you know that you don't get a big surprise at the end by getting a, a big questionnaire from the state of, of Georgia or whatever it may be to say, well, you had four sales in Georgia. You have to file a Georgia state tax return. And that happens frequently. Now, now there's there's this word that gets thrown a lot, around a lot. A lot of people just traveling to the state see it and businesses see it. There's this word called nexus. What exactly does Nexus mean and kind of why should entrepreneurs be very aware of this? Nexus means it's a connection with the particular state. So if you have a connection with the state, chances are you have to file some type of documentation with the state. And when I do a lot of business with Canadians and Americans, so the Americans think one thing when they come into Canada, that if they have a salesperson in Canada, they have to file a return immediately. Canadians, on the other hand, we're more familiar with a term called permanent establishment, which is effectively bricks and mortar, or alternatively, somebody who has the authority to contract on behalf of the business. And so when we go down to the States, we seem to go down to the States, you know, with the, the, the I don't care kind of attitude where we just, oh yeah, we've been selling into 27 States and it's like not a problem. We filed nothing in the States. Well, that's a problem. No question. I mean, I can turn to Mike and Bev. I mean, you guys, you guys sell to the States. Uh, you know, what has been your experience? Is it a compliance nightmare? Uh, no, because when we, when we opened up our U S uh, company, we went to our accountants and we said, what do we have to do? And they said, you, the first and uh, foremost is, uh, set up a proper transfer price book or documentation to make sure the Canadian government is happy, the U.S. government is happy between the two businesses. And, of course, if we have to file, we file. And we'll, we file, I think, in 26 different states. And that was from minute one. 
And there's no question that uh, <coughs> all governments are uh, are pretty much broke these days. So everybody wants their their piece of the pie. Absolutely. Uh, is there something, Ernie? You know, Mike mentioned transfer pricing. Uh, just a, a quick commentary. What exactly is it, and kind of documentation that that businesses should kind of, should think about? Businesses should take a look at what it, because they, what the Canadian government wants is they want you to sell your stuff and they want to keep your profit in Canada. The U.S. government wants the opposite. They want you to sell your stuff in the states and they want you to keep your profit in the states. So somewhere in between there is what the proper transfer price is. So the transfer price you're going to sell down down there so you make a profit. Uh, in Canada, and the Canadian and the U.S. arm also makes a profit, so everybody's happy at the end of the day. And that's the simplistic view of transfer pricing. Now, there's what happens if you're a Canadian company and you 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 sell to the states, but you don't have Nexus, or you just have a a showroom that you have. Is there are you are you caught into a lot of these rules, or not really? You can be caught into some of the rules, but you generally have to file a protective type of a U.S. return, uh, which is a treaty-based U.S. return. And that treaty-based U.S. return just basically says, hello, U.S. government, I am selling into the states, but I don't have any nexus in any of the states. As such, I'm just telling you I'm selling into the states, but I'm not going to be taxable because I have no fixed place of business in the states, because that's based on the treaty. Now, the states work a little differently. You could have no federal nexus or permanent establishment, but the state may think you have a nexus and may consider you to have nexus if you're actually traveling through the state, like in the state of New Jersey, if you travel through with your own trucks, they will consider you to have nexus. In the state of Pennsylvania, they'll also consider you to have nexus if you have an independent sales rep who is doing business on your behalf. There's all kinds of very particular rules and you really need an expert in each of these jurisdictions to get the real answer. More of Ernie's thoughts on uh, tax issues selling to the United States, and we'll have Beverly and Michael's one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur. That's next. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 7.55 on today's entrepreneur, Beverly and Michael Solatinu of West Group are here and Ernie Furt as well, tax partner at Fuller Landau, talking about selling to the U.S. and uh, the tax challenges uh, that come with it. And what we're really talking about is there's there is there are many forms to complete. There's but really before you even get there, you got to ask the right questions. You got to kind of plan it properly. Uh, I believe Mike and Bev, we you know we were talking off air, and you, you were you were you were very 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 direct and saying you know what we just got to do it right. It doesn't matter what it is, we just got to do it right, and this is our business, and that we go. Ernie, are there maybe some some questions that entrepreneurs need to you know simple ones that they got to ask themselves? to determine, hey, do I got to start complying with certain federal, state, county, backwards? If you're selling into a foreign jurisdiction, whether it's the states or or, or elsewhere, you got to start talking to people in that jurisdiction. To And first you start with your accountant. Yeah, you ask him or her, is there any special things that I need to know before I enter into this uh, into these sales, into the states or elsewhere before I go to this trade show? Do I have to file anything? Do I need any special papers if I go to sell stuff in the states? It's great to know all this stuff at the beginning so you know the rules of the game and then you can play the game properly and you can sleep at night. You file all your requisite papers. You don't get a bunch of crazy penalty notices and, 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 and stuff that just will make you crawl because these notices can come out of nowhere and you won't know what hit you and all of a sudden your profit margin will be gone. So make sure you do the proper compliance, factor it all in, talk to the right people, start from the beginning. Don't come to your accountant and say, well, you know, I have these letters that I haven't responded to. What do you think I should do with them? And not to get into the, to the dollar amount of penalties, but it's one thing, you know, you might save a whole hell of a lot of money by actually filing the forms, even if you don't know any tax, versus the potential penalties that the IRS might might invoke. The IRS can invoke large penalties for failure to file certain forms. There's ten thousand dollar penalties for failure to file certain forms for you know transactions between parents and uh, parent corporations and their subsidiaries, and vice versa. So it's always important to look at the filing requirements because the IRS makes a lot of money on penalties. 
So you want to stay away from the penalties, and it's very difficult to get those penalties abated. You have to be in the right situation, and you may be able to get them abated. And federal, state, city, county, uh, you, you got to, like, there's there's so many layers, right? There is tons of layers. In New York State alone, I think I must have mentioned this once or twice on this show, I think there's more than 50 taxing jurisdictions, and there's different rates for different things. So big retail stores really, really have to deal with that diligently. An absolute minefield. Thanks very much, Ernie. So as we approach our last moments of the show, uh, we'll turn to Beverly and Mike and ask them, what would be your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur? I think for me, um, know your market and really uh, surround yourself with good people. And if you're going outside of your market, make sure that you have people in that market who know the land landmines and landfield and and really have a good understanding of the area that you're doing business in excellent mike i think for me it's about slow and steady i think it's about taking your time don't be in a rush you know our business uh, it's 55 years old and we're still learning and we're still growing but we're growing slowly but steadily and uh, thank you very much. And uh, Dan, you know, we've, we've heard from, we always hear from many entrepreneurs. And I guess the takeaway that I get from, from Mike and Beverly, and there's, there's probably many, so I'll have to sit through it. But it's really, uh, you know, Mike said, you know, go with your gut and, and know, what, know what you're doing. Uh, I, I think it's being a little methodical. And, you know, yes, you can go with your gut, but you know what? Plan it out, look ahead, measure it, adjust it, move on. Uh, I think being... Being methodical, certainly as your business is growing, so you don't, uh, so you don't waste a whole bunch of dollars and resources. I think that that's key, and I, I think to attribute to the success of, of the West Group. Thanks, Josh, and thanks to Beverly and Michael of West Group for uh, dropping by this evening. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. And Ernie Furt, tax partner for Lalanda. Thank you as well, sir. And we are back uh, next Monday night. No, sorry, two weeks from now on today's Entrepreneur on CJAD 800. The Exchange with Richard Yuffie is next. It's eight o'clock.